Clean your room. Yeah. Wash the dishes. Why? Because I said so. You should really consider this vehicle, sir. It's cheaper, and it's more suited to your daily travel needs, if you, as you've described to me. It better will suit your purposes. You should go to the doctor, sir. That looks painful, and I have to tell you, it doesn't look normal. You should probably go get that checked out. Sir, as your doctor, I'm telling you, you need to have this surgery. Why? Because I'm your doctor and I said so. These are different words, to use the language that our gospel reading says, that have authority. These examples I gave to you, though, appeal to two different kinds of authority. One set appealed to an authority granted by status or position. Like the example I gave from parents, right? They just have to say, because I said so. Are they wrong for saying that? No. God has actually given them authority over their kids. And so they do have an inherent authority as parents. Now, they may have to weigh the cost of whether or not that will be the most fruitful response, given the situation, but that's the appeal to status or authority. And it's the same with the doctor, right? The doctor is telling you to have the surgery because he's the guy that went to school and did all the studying of anatomy and medical biology and that you went to go see because you trust his opinion. The other one is the car salesman and your friend urging you to go to the doctor. And that's an appeal to logic or persuasion. Their authority is in persuading you with convincing you that what they're saying makes sense. You shouldn't spend as much money on your car because this other car will suit your needs perfectly given what you've described to me. And you'll save money. right? Or going to the doctor because you're in a lot of pain and that doesn't look so good. You should probably get that checked out. Nobody in those exchanges has a position of authority over the other, but they're using logic to persuade them. And then their words have a persuasive authority. Well, in our gospel reading today, the people, we are told, are amazed at the word of Jesus. And it specifically tells us why. Because it has authority. But which type of authority does it have? And even beyond that, what does it matter? Does it make a difference which type of authority Jesus' word possesses? Well, let's find out. So sit still and listen. I'm talking. Why? Because I'm the pastor and I said so. Just kidding. Our gospel reading picks up where we left off last week. At the beginning of Jesus' mission and ministry on earth in the book of Luke. And last week, you may remember we had some excitement. Jesus was teaching at the synagogue in his hometown and he was rejected. And not just rejected because his teaching was poor, but rejected to the point that they wanted to take him to the cliff outside of the city and throw him off of it. So much for persuasive authority. But remember, we also talked about Luke's depiction of Jesus. His Christology, his analysis of Christ, the person of Christ, is that he is the ultimate and final prophet. And that he's presented in two particular ways. One is as the preacher and teacher and worker of miracles. And that one, that part of Jesus, is met with astonishment and adulation. People flock to him because they hear of these things he says and does. And the second one was the prophet as the rejected one. That just as the people of God in the Old Testament rejected those whom God sent to speak his word, so too will they reject the great prophet, the Messiah, Jesus. They weren't so happy about that one. Well, here this depiction of Jesus as prophet continues, but with a slightly different focus. 
And our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah highlights this quite nicely. And this is really a formula throughout the Old Testament for all of the prophets. The beginning of our reading started out with the word of the Lord came to the prophet. Right? And notice that it's Lord with all capital letters. And when Lord in English is spelled with all capital letters, you can substitute the word Yahweh. The word of Yahweh, God's word, came to the prophet. But then some problems arise, as is pretty typical. Imagine God coming to you and saying, I am going to send you to my people who have strayed, and you're going to tell them a bunch of stuff they don't want to hear. And usually the prophet was like trying to convince God that they picked the wrong person for the job. <laughs> doesn't really work, though. So he starts out by saying that he's afraid, and he's afraid for two reasons. One, he's young, and then we get the famous passage from God that says, don't let people look down on you for your youth, and because he's afraid that he won't know how to speak. How many of you can echo that sentiment? I've heard that so many times over the years as a pastor that the worry you have in talking to your children about faith or sharing your faith with your friend or your coworker is what if I mess up the words? What if I don't say it correctly? Well, take comfort in God's response to Jeremiah. It wasn't, well, buck up and just deal with it. Instead, God touches his mouth and says that he now no longer is going to be speaking his own words, but now the word of God. So here we see that Jeremiah, along with all the other prophets in the scriptures, from Moses all the way to John the Baptist, their authority is in the word of God that is given to them. It is a borrowed authority from God. A gifted authority, if you will. And so it is the same with Jesus in Luke 4. He has been given the authority of God's word as the ultimate and final prophet. The last and complete fulfilled word from God. But you'll notice there's one extremely important distinction. Nowhere do you see a verse saying the word of the Lord came to Jesus. The word of the Lord was not given to Jesus. This signifies that Jesus possesses the same authority as God's word. But it's not being given to him. It is within him. It is him. He isn't just a prophet after all, borrowing the authority of God's word as a gift from God, but the final fulfilling prophet, the word of God himself, incarnate and fleshed, as we learn in John chapter 1, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is Jesus. And in Luke chapter 4, this messianic revelation begins to take hold. Jesus is teaching again in the synagogue, as he was last week, out on the Sabbath. And people have a similar response at the very beginning of last week's reading and this one. They're astonished at what he is saying. But this week we get a little more information as to what they're astonished about. They're astonished because the word that Jesus speaks and preaches and teaches with has authority. It possesses authority. But what do they mean by that? That's sort of a strange phrase. Have you ever said that to somebody? Like, wow, that was great teaching. Your word possessed authority. That's a strange phrase. What does that mean exactly? Well, our question is answered in the following verses. Right after this moment, a man with an unclean demon spirit comes into the synagogue and he tries to use his word to rebuke Jesus. He says, what have you come here for? You're here to destroy us. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't grab a sword and smite the demon. He simply says, be still and come out of him. Or wait, <clears throat> let me put on my authority voice. Be still and come out of him. And what happens? There's no struggle. It simply 
happens the way he says. In other words, he has authority over this unclean spirit. So much authority that his mere word makes it do what he says. What authority is Jesus appealing to? What authority does he possess? It's the authority of status and station. Notice he doesn't persuade the demon to leave. He doesn't say, oh, well, there's this other person outside who would be a much better vessel for you. I think you would rather go into him. So why don't you leave this guy, make me look good in here to these people, and go in that guy out there? He doesn't do that. He simply commands. For all of the language students out there, this is an imperative It is a straight command from Jesus to the unclean spirit, and it can't but do anything but obey. And so it does. And if there was any doubt in your mind that this really was the authority that Jesus possessed, the next example sort of puts it to rest. They go to Simon's house, and his mother-in-law is sick with a fever, and it says Jesus rebuked the fever. He spoke the fever away, basically, and it left her. That one doesn't even give you the option to consider a logical argument because a fever doesn't have a brain. It can't consider reasoning. It simply is something that happens. And Jesus even has authority over that. So now we begin to see why the people are marveling at the teaching of Jesus and the words that he says because his word does possess authority. I mean, imagine for a moment, let's step out of this story, imagine for a moment that I possess that kind of authority, and I demonstrated it in front of you. I think the proper response would be astonishment and awe. You'd probably think I'm something more than just a man. And in the case of Jesus, you're exactly right. The comedian Jim Gaffigan sort of made a play on this authority um, and a joke about it where he said that if I was Jesus, I wouldn't have just made regular bread multiply. Right? He has the authority. He can just say, boom, garlic knots. Boom, pretzel bread. Right? And he has this scene. Where Jesus, does he have that authority? Yeah, he does. He could do that. Right? Because he is the God, the almighty God of the universe. So Jesus' word possesses inherent authority. He isn't receiving it from God. He is the word of God in the flesh. So unlike Jeremiah... He's not receiving it, but it is within him from the beginning. And he simply declares things to be, and they are so. And this is actually really helpful for us, because it is the basis for all of the words that Jesus says. It doesn't really give you many options, right? C.S. Lewis is famous for coining the the three L phrase about the options that that Jesus gives you. He's either the Lord, a liar, or a loon. He can't be a great teacher, he can't be a great prophet, because if he isn't speaking from the authority to which he claims, he's either a crazy person who thinks he's God and isn't, or he's just a liar. But this account in Luke 4 proves that those two options are no longer available to us because he can rebuke demonic spirits and fevers for crying out loud. Crazy people can't do that, and liars can't do that. Only the Lord only the one with the authority to do so. Now, what does it mean for us? What's the big deal? Why am I spending so much time making sure you understand what type of authority Jesus possesses? Because the distinction between Jesus having God's authority and Jesus being God's authority is extremely important for us because we rely on this very same word. It's this very same word that is brought to bear in our lives, not only the very same word that accuses us of our sinfulness, but it's also the very same word that preaches the gospel to us, that declares us righteous. This means that when Jesus speaks, when his word is given, it is spoken as God's word. This means that we can truly trust And place our faith in the things that he says, both now and what will be. See, Luke is establishing early on that when Jesus speaks, 
What he's really doing is he's bringing to bear the kingdom of God here and now in this world. He has the authority to do that. No longer does the prophet that God sends bring promises of a savior, but the savior, the prophet ultimate, has arrived, God himself, and he's here fulfilling those words of promise and declaring them fulfilled and true. Now all of a sudden his authority makes all the difference in the world. For who can say your sins are forgiven? Who can say you will live forever? Only the person who has the authority to do so. One of my favorite connections in scripture was made for me when I was at the seminary and it just sort of brought this sort of this line of thought to life for me. The very same word that at the beginning of all things said, let there be light, and there was, is the very same word that says to you, your sins are forgiven. And they are. This means that when Jesus claims you in baptism as God's child, you are. This means when Jesus says he's preparing a place for you in his kingdom and you will live with him forever there, you will. Because what he says happens. He has the authority in his very word to do exactly what he says. This is the source of all of our comfort in the gospel. For without somebody with the proper authority to declare to you that the debt that you owe to God is wiped clean, it means nothing. Right? Just like the appeal to the authority we mentioned at the beginning. When your doctor tells you you should have a surgery, you should probably have the surgery. If a random person on the street that you don't know says, hey, you should go have gallbladder surgery, you're going to think, what about them? They're a crazy person. Because it's not the right person who has the right authority. And so to hear, when somebody declares to you, your sins are forgiven, if it's just some random person you don't know, it means nothing. But when the Son of God with all the authority of God to bear in his word, says your sins are forgiven. They are. Right then and there. Just like the unclean spirit had no other choice but to obey, so too are your sins removed. Your sickness, like that fever, disappears because he declares it. So dear friends in Christ, there is no doubt that Jesus has the authority. It's not a borrowed authority. He's not coming to make more promises about the future, but to bring all of them as yes in him, to fulfill every promise, every word of God, word of Yahweh brought by the prophets is fulfilled in Christ because he's not a mere prophet. He is the son of God. He is the word made flesh. So you may be wondering why you're not constantly astonished and in awe because you hear God's word, don't you? Where is that word of authority now? You just heard it read today. You probably have it in a book sitting on your nightstand or your coffee table at home. The written word of God. This is the same word. The spoken word of your brother and sister in Christ in your time of need who reminds you that in Christ your sins are forgiven. It's never been about your good deeds and your accomplishments in this life. That's this same word. It is within the church on earth. It is in you and me. Now, unlike Jesus, we have a borrowed authority because we never become the one who can declare people's sins forgiven in the eyes of God. We simply point them to the same person who declared our sins forgiven. And so they are in Jesus. Now, if we look at the end of the book of Luke, when Jesus reappears to his disciples after his resurrection, he reminds them of this very thing. He says this, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He returns their focus to his words, the things that he said, the, the truths that he spoke. What is this word, the crowds ask, after hearing Jesus talk? 
The answer Jesus gives us and Luke teaches today is the one that we carry with us wherever we go. This is God's word. It has authority over unclean spirits and disease. It has authority over sin. It has authority over death. And that word, that word that possesses that authority declares to you today, your sins are forgiven. Your death has been swallowed up in the victory of Christ. You are a child of God. And so you are. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in that authority of Christ by which he declares you his own until he comes again to make everything new. Amen.